for some of you theological elites, I know that singing is not one of the spiritual gifts listed in Paul's two list of the spiritual gifts. But I see it really as a spiritual gift. But it has a kind of a two-way direction instead of a one-way direction. You know the word grace itself. The word can be interpreted, first of all, as grace if it's coming from God. But it also can be interpreted using the same word as gratitude when it's coming from us. So I see the spiritual gift of singing as something that God has given to us, helping us to be able to do something with our faith and put it into action in song. Because most of the songs that we like to sing have some action involved in it. We'll see that when you start naming some of the hymns that you want to sing. Martin Luther said, the devil takes flight at the sound of music just as he does the words of theology. And for this reason, the prophets always combine theology and music, the teaching of truth and the chanting of psalms and hymns. And then he added, after theology, I give the highest place and the greatest honor to music. This idea of the spiritual gift of singing is one that is something that we should be thinking about. My earliest recollections of my home church in Central Christian Church in Augusta, Georgia, were the great hymn sings that we had every fifth Sunday evening. Now we had service every Sunday evening and they were filled with gospel hymns and people who would be coming. You had to go, we didn't have anything else to do in Augusta, Georgia, so we went to church morning and night. So it was always something that we could do on Sunday evening, and it was great. But those hymn sings were something special because we were singing then the songs that we wanted to sing rather than songs that someone else was selecting for us, and you're going to have that opportunity. Our minister at that time, who had been with the church for about 25 years, had come to our congregation really to conduct a revival. He was a singing evangelist, but he liked our congregation so much he decided to serve. So he would bring into almost every one of our worship services some kind of music. Ordinarily on Sunday morning there were the praise type hymns, the stately kind of hymns, but then in the evening there would be all of the gospel hymns and choruses and what have you but there would usually be an anthem by the church choir. And that was always one of my favorites because these people had worked hard and they were singing all of the time. So the number of hymns that we sing today will be dependent on how much we want to sing. When you think about it, we really have a singing religion, a musical faith. It is one of the most distinguishing marks of Christianity. Our Bible is full of songs. Christian liturgy revolves around all of those songs. The Quakers may be an exception. The Orthodox also might not give a strong place to congregational singing, but the Bible witness is this. Moses sang. David sang. Jesus sang. Paul and his churches were singing churches. The Bible even asserts that all that the creation of the morning stars rang together. And the revelation of John in its vision of the final victory of God, the dominant exercise of the world is to come, is singing. So we've got a lot of singing to do today. When we sing, we sing to God. We sing about Christ but we sing to each other. I wish that I had said at the very beginning that I'd like for all of you to come forward because I think when we do the hymn sing, it would be so good for you to hear other people sing because that's not happening too many times in congregations now. The only person I hear in the congregational singing is me 
and I'd rather be hearing someone else participating in that. God is the audience, really, of our singing, not the congregation, but God. Not the television audience or the radio audience, but God. Not the ministers, but God. When we sing, we praise God. We sing, we pray to God. When we sing, we consecrate ourselves to God. That is why some people lift their hands when they're singing these praises. Music really is an offering that we bring to God. Everything in the worship service ought to be seen as an offering. Yes, even when we pass the offering plate. We know that that is an offering. We call it that. We bring from what God has provided and we offer it back to God. But the same is true also of our prayers. They also are our offering, our gratitude to our God, our offering of praise, petition, and intercession. This sermon is my offering to God. It is for God, hopefully from God, and hopefully on behalf of God, and in the truest sense of the word, to God. In the same way, all our music is to God. I intend to praise God when I sing. Don't you? We intend to please God when we sing. Don't we? And when it is from the heart and from the soul and from the deepest places in our being, God receives it as it were written by Mozart and sung by angels. Do you recall the book of Hebrews that says to us and to all Christians in chapter 13, through Christ, let us continually offer, offer up a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that confess his name. Yes, we sing to God and we sing about Christ. And what does our text say? sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual sing songs to God about Christ, but they are for really each other. What is the first song that we teach our children? Everyone would begin singing, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. I should be singing this. There's another song now that we sing. It has a text for children, especially my grandchildren. Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. We sing, though, for each other. You never know what spiritual trauma sits next to you in the pew. What desperate prayers are being lifted up by those who are sitting beside you. What defeats are being remembered. What sadness has settled in somebody's soul. You are singing for them. Your words of hope, of love, and of assurance, of trust in God are just the words they need to hear. In Frankfort, Kentucky, there's a church that sits almost adjacent to a bridge by the Kentucky River. It is known as the Singing Bridge. And the church advertises itself as the church by the Singing Bridge. Wouldn't you rather be known as the Singing Church by the bridge? Northwood is a singing church. I think it's what attracted us to this church. 50 years ago this month, August 1966, is when we came into this congregation and what a musical program we had. And I'm hoping that one of these days we shall see some more of that kind of musical program that builds this church, grows this church, and makes it the church that it should be. What would our church be without a song? I used to try to sing that song in my younger days. Without a song, the day would never end. 
Without a song, the road would never bend. When things go wrong, a man ain't got a friend without a song. I got my trouble in war, and sure I know the Jordan will roll. I'll get along as long as a song is strong in my soul. I'll never know what makes the rain to fall. I'll never know what makes the grass so tall. I only know there ain't no life at all without a song. Maybe you all ought to help me sing that as one of the hymns because that almost has a religious flavor to it. At least I think it does. Love isn't love until it is expressed. God expressed his fathomless love by giving his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. But our love isn't love at all without his song, without being strongly sung in our soul, without a song of gratitude on our lips in praise for all that God has given. This does not mean that all of us have to sing well or beautifully as Christians in order to praise God. I'm even more convinced that God is not concerned so much with the artistic quality of our praise as with the intent behind it. If we are ashamed to sing, then we do not feel worthy to praise God. Our pride stands in the way, and a silent mouth cannot worship God. But if we sincerely are willing to try to make a joyful noise unto the Lord and to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in our hearts to God, then the door opens to the God's kingdom and the dialogue of worship begins. We should let go of our inhibitions. Listen to the music carefully. Listen to our neighbor in the pew who just might be able to sing and allow ourselves to be swept up by the music and the words of the liturgy and hymns. This is the first step toward full participation. Our hymn of dedication this morning is number 619. It's called My Life Flows On. And though the origins of this song are somewhat in doubt, its message is clear. How can I keep from singing? It's a song of one who has weathered persecution and struggle, but maintains a focus on the rock, giving thanks for all the song. Most hymnals, as does Chalice, ascribe authorship to Robert Lowry, who lived from 1826 to 1899. And since the song appears in this famous collection, Bright Jewels for the Sunday School in 1869, Lowry was really known as a gifted Baptist preacher, educator, and composer of gospel songs on the East Coast of the U.S., that is, on the East Coast of the United States. There are eight hymns in our chalice hymn by Robert Lowry. Most of these we know. Christ arose. Savior, thy dying love. All the way my Savior leads me. I need thee every hour. My life flows on is one. And then we cannot own the sunlit sky. And then what we call the disciples' national anthem, shall we gather at the river. And the last one, marching to Zion. All of these are songs by Robert Lowry. 